الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي أدولا أن هدانا الله وصلى الله على سيدنا حبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين Respected brothers and sisters, we begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal as He is most worthy and deserving of all praise. We ask Allah and we ask Allah alone to guide us, to prevent us from being misguided and from misguiding others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless His noble Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam to bless His noble companions his family and the righteous everywhere. And finally, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our shortcomings and our weaknesses individually and collectively. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins, those that we commit knowingly, unknowingly, consciously, and unconsciously. The last time I was here, uh, respected brothers and sisters, um, I was speaking about the uh, inner dimensions of the salah, of the worship, of the prayer. And uh, due to the time, we were not unable to finish or to continue that conversation and that discussion. And so, inshallah, my intention today is to conclude by discussing the virtues of the prayer itself. Now, when we talk about the prayer, and I'm speaking specifically about the ritual prayer or the salah, Something as intimate of a relationship as that prayer affords us with our Lord, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that is so profound and so meaningful, something that in fact the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds us will be the first action and deeds and deeds that we are called into account for is the prayer. And if that is sound and secure, then the rest of our recording or our accountability will follow suit in that regard. And so the prayer is paramount. It is in fact one of the sort of determining factors between Iman and Kufr, between belief and disbelief, is the observation of the Salah. That one cannot imagine that something that is so uh, central and, in it and, and integral to the faith, such as the Salah, would not have in it and through it virtues and um, lessons and characteristics that we can attain that would have profound implications. Implications that are found not only in the actual prayer itself, and by that I mean what is recited and how we observe the prayer, but also in the very form of the prayer itself. That the very form of the prayer is not by accident. It is not, by super, it is not superfluous, it's not just incidental, but rather it is essential to the prayer. As the Prophet, again, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us to pray, Sallu kama yusalli, that pray as you have seen me pray. And so that is an observation and a reflection on the actual form of the prayer itself. And so the last time we were able to examine and look at the prerequisites and intervals of that, of the prerequisites and the requirements before we even engage in the prayer. And we talked about the wudu and we talked about the direction of the qibla and the importance and the value that that has beyond just observing the wudu or carrying out the wudu and the implications that has to the purification of that lies of that which lies internally that which lies in us and the same applies for qibla and having a direction and intentionality and purpose in life and so if we can move from that to the form of the prayer itself to the actual prayer we can reflect on the fact that one of the first the, one of the first observing acts or integral components of the prayer is again that niyyah inna mal'amalu bin-niyat right as the oft repeated hadith informs us that indeed actions are but by their intentions that intentionality having purpose 
having drive, having a reason for why we do things, rather than just doing things uh, haphazardly or without observing its intention, is the lesson here. Is, and that intention, whether it's verbal or something that we recite in our hearts, is an integral, is an integral component of the Salah. But that should inform us of the purpose and the importance of having, again, intentionality and purpose and drive for the reasons and purpose for why we do the things that we do, rather than just engaging in ritual or engaging in the various aspects of our life without any drive, without any intention, without any purpose. And so we must be conscious of and be mindful of the fact <laughs> that that niyyah that we compose during our prayer has consequences that go beyond just the prayer itself. Not that that is a, uh, a, a light or trivial matter, but that, that it, having intention and niyyah in all aspects of our lives, beyond just the prayer, but having intention and purpose in all aspects of our lives. And this could have utilitarian benefit as well. That is to say, benefit that you see on a daily basis. Imagine if you woke up and whatever rituals you engage in in the morning, and by ritual I don't mean you know, a religious ritual, but rather just whatever you do. You brush your teeth, you take a shower, you get dressed and you leave, you eat breakfast, you have coffee. Whatever the ritual, the mundane aspects, so-called mundane aspects of your life, if we pause for a moment, and are more mindful of having intention and niya and purpose by which we eat, by which we dress, by which we comport ourselves before we leave to work or whatever endeavors that we wish to pursue. Not to mention the very endeavors and work that we pursue throughout the day. If we do those things with niya, with intention, with intentionality and purpose, that is one of the characteristics of a successful person, of people who are successful, in that they are mindful of why they're doing the things that they're doing, rather than just engaging in those things, uh, motion, uh, you know, just engaging in the mode, just going through the motions, rather than reflecting on the purposes for why they do what they do. And so, niya and intention and intentionality in all that we do is something that is of uh, 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 something of consequence and importance, and something that the salah and the prayer is reminding us daily, and many times and several times throughout the day. And then the very first act that we do that actually engages us in the prayer itself, the raising of the hands, the raising of the hands. This is a universal symbol across cultures, uh, 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 across the world, this is a universal symbol of what? Of surrender, right? The child is, you know, hold your hands up, right? Hands up, you surrender, you're submitting to something. That is a universal gesture of our submission and surrender. And what is greater than surrendering and submitting ourselves to the Lord and cherisher of the worlds? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that idea, that very, uh, that is the, 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 the overarching, the overarching lesson of the prayer is that we are submitting and surrendering ourselves to a greater power, to a higher power, to a greater purpose, to a higher purpose. And that is Allah and the pleasure of Allah. And so, but surrendering and submitting ourselves not only when it comes to the ritual of the prayer itself, as the Quran reminds us, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Qul, it begins, the verse begins, say that indeed my prayer, my sacrifice, my service, my living and my dying are for you, O Allah, the Lord of the universe. Is for Allah, it is for Allah, lillahi. It is for God. And so, not only in terms of our prayer, but all of our endeavors should be mindful of, and we should be mindful of, surrendering and submitting to the will of God through all aspects of our daily lives. 
in how we work, in how we live, in how we engage with our family members, with our community members, with our brothers and sisters in this fraternity of our ummah, but also uh, uh, how we engage in society. Having that concept of that we are doing this lillah to, for the sake and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is what we are submitting ourselves to. And so surrender and submission begins this very prayer. And then, and this is not going to go in any particular order necessarily, but we know that one of the integral components of the prayer is the recital of Surah Al-Fatiha and, and a few other verses of the Qur'an. The reminder that the recitation and the reflection of the, of the Qur'an, moistening, moistening our tongues with the remembrance of God and the remembrance of His Word, of His Book, is something that transcends beyond, again, just the prayer. That we are reminded, con we are reminded constant, constantly to be connected and to have a relationship with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that that relationship should be infused in our lives. The relationship with Allah and His Word should be infused in our lives. That the Qur'an is not just something that we place upon the loftiest of shelves or the, or the highest place in our house, gathering dust. But rather the Qur'an is something, is a living, breathing document and a living, breathing text by which we live our lives, by which we are constantly connected with, that constant connection with the Book of Allah, the constant reminder that we should be moistening our tongues with the remembrance of God and the remembrance of His Word, of His Book. This is what the Salah is teaching us, is to be mindful of being connected, being wired, if you will, just speaking in Silicon Valley parlance, right? to be connected, to be wired, hot-wired to the, to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if your connection is loose, you'll find that aspects of your life are missing, right? You're, you're not downloading anything because you're not connected. You're not downloading any inspiration, any aspiration, anything from God because you're not connected. You're not hardwired. You're not downloading what you need to be downloading because that is what the Qur'an is doing us, is affording us a constant connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the recital of the Qur'an in the prayer is a reminder of us to be connected to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to begin concluding, the perhaps the most crucial or one of the most beautiful aspects, I should say, of the prayer is the prostration, which is the symbol of the prayer, right? The symbol of the prayer. This masjid is a place of sujood, is a place of prostration. It is where we prostrate. And we know that according as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that one of his, one of his miraculous things was that the entire world was made a place of prostration, a place where we can uh, engage in the prayer. But that, 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 that act of prostration itself, the most intimate act of obedience and subservience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the words of the poet Iqbal from the subcontinent, ye ek sajda jise tu ghira samajta hai, deta hai admi ko that this one sajda that you think is so taxing, so difficult on your life, something that you struggle with, don't you know that it prevents you from a thousand sujood? Because once you have submitted to the Lord and the Creator of the universe, to Allah, how can you surrender or submit to anything else? How can we submit to any other power? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Right? There is no power or might that is greater than Allah. There is nothing greater than Allah. Certainly not our base desires and passions. Right? When we submit to our nafs, when we submit to those 
uh, lower animal drives and instincts, whether it's for hunger, hunger or thirst or sexual satisfaction, when we find illicit means by which we satisfy those needs, satisfy those very real needs, how are we, that doesn't comport. It doesn't, there's some dissonance here. How can you surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest of all powers, the greatest of all things, and then surrender to something as base and lowly as our desires, as our passions, as our ego? But the very physical act of the prayer itself, of the sajda itself, brothers and sisters, this one sajda, right? This one sajda. Imagine that our, right here, this, our frontal lobe, our brain, whatever you want to call it, right? This contains our ego, our sense of worth, our sense of who we are. I'm this, my resume looks like this. I have these initials after my name. I'm somebody. I'm someone unique and I'm something, uh, I'm someone great and should be, should be measured accordingly. All of that ego, all of those, all of, all of what we comport ourselves to be, right here in our brains, what do we do with it? A minimum of five times a day. We literally put it into the dust, into the dirt where it belongs. That ego, feelings of who you are, what makes you special, what makes you different, what makes you better than someone else because of who you think you are or what skills or knowledge that you've accumulated that somehow makes you better than someone else. That sense of ego. And, and having a sense of self-worth is not something that's necessarily problematic. right? You should value yourself. Allah has made you human beings and we are a beautiful creation of Allah. So it's not to devalue that, but the ego, right? That which makes us think that we're better than someone else. How much we have in our bank account or what car we drove in this afternoon. It's those things, that sense of ego and pride and arrogance right here. And we put it into the dirt and we submit it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's where those things belong. That's where we belong. And indeed, even that sense of self-worth is meaningless when it comes to how we feel and how we should be subjugating ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, by conclusion, brothers and sisters, by way of conclusion, is the communal prayer, the congregational prayer, something that, inshallah, we will be engaging in shortly. This is a beautiful reminder, not only of the sense of community that that affords us, that coming together of all of us, look around, various nationalities and languages and creeds and, and social status right here represented in our midst. And we will join together and line up row to row, row by row, shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet, you know, feet adjourning each other. And we line up straight before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No distinction, right, between who is rich and who is not and who has the knowledge and who doesn't. But we line up in a single file and we submit and we surrender ourselves to the Lord and cherisher of the universe. But the congregational prayer is not only a reminder of the beauty of our community, but it also informs us a lesson in leadership, right? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I will be leading this prayer very shortly. And I am the imam of this particular prayer. And the communal prayer, the congregational prayer, informs and teaches us a lesson of leadership and how we should obey leadership unless leadership is doing something wrong or incorrect. And even if leadership is doing something wrong or incorrect, there is a procedure, there is a process to follow by which we correct our leadership. Right? If I were to make a, uh, a mistake in the prayer shortly, you will correct me. If I mess up in the recital, you will remind me. If I forget a verse of the Quran that I'm reciting, you will remind me. If I make a ruku when I'm not supposed to, or when I stand up when I'm not supposed to, 
inshallah, you will remind me. You will correct me. But you don't correct me by following, by, by forming your own jama'ah or masjid or medla somewhere. But there is a process and a procedure to correct our leadership, to correct our leaders. And beautifully enough, it's by glorifying God. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, right? To correct, Allahu Akbar, to correct a mistake. And if all the men are asleep, the ladies have, the sisters have a way that they can correct our leadership. An equal opportunity to correct leadership, to rectify the course of action that a leader has taken. But again, there is a process. There is a procedure by which we do that. It doesn't require us to be disagreeable, disagreeable with one another, to form different <coughs> groups and offerings, but rather we work together for a, com for a common cause. And if there are mistakes that are made by our leaderships, by our leadership, and indeed there will be mistakes made by our leadership, because our leaders are only human. And so those mistakes will be made. But the question is, how do we engage in a process by which we not only hold that leader accountable, but what process and mechanisms have we created in our communities by which leadership can be corrected and yet still maintained? That leadership can be corrected but still followed. And so that is the beauty, brothers and sisters, among many of the virtues and aspects of the communal prayer and, and inshallah ta'ala of the prayer itself. And so I hope that we can begin to realize and reflect on the profundity of these rituals, these things that we almost go in autopilot mode and engage in. But rather we should be reflective of and be mindful of the beautiful and profound lessons that these rituals have in our lives not only with regards to the, to the form or the ritual itself, but rather that something that transcends and should be infused in the way in which we live our lives. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سليدا يصلح لكم عمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطيع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا لا تواخذنا إن نسينا أو أخفعنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما أهمته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا تأخذ لنا بوعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا بقلب الخلوب ثبت خلوبا على دينك اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من صفتك والنار ربنا آتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وخنا أذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وعفين الصلاة